Um, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Penn. I am the program manager of social, cultural, and constitutional studies at the American Enterprise Institute and a proud member of the editorial board here at American Purpose. Uh, welcome to the third day of American Purpose's Continuing Liberty Conference. Some of you have been tuning into panels from the past three days, two days. For others, this will be the first panel that you've attended. And we are just so honored to have you join us for this conversation on a house divided polarization post Trump. In his inaugural speech delivered just weeks after a mob led a violent assault on the Capitol building, President Biden promised to be a president for all Americans. Although the term polarization was not literally in his speech, it was a specter haunting the entire address as he urged the nation to end this uncivil war that pits red against blue, rural versus urban, conservative versus liberal. Although cultural and political polarization have been pulling at our national seams for many years prior to 2016, its ruinous effects on our democracy became most visible during the four years of Trump's presidency, an era that gave a new sense of urgency to the study of this dangerous phenomenon. As a magazine dedicated to the defense of liberal democracy, there is a reason why the threat posed by polarization is a recurrent theme occupying the minds that write for American purpose. From conversations with Jonathan Rauch to essays by Larry Diamond, Adam Garfinkel, Thomas Koenig, and many others that we can hopefully share in the chat near the end of the webinar, um, the more radical and insular our views have become, the less likely we are to subscribe to the legitimacy of a political system that is designed to forge compromise and accommodation which just happens to be the foundation of the American constitutional order. We're not here to talk just of theory and to rehash the past. We're actually here to talk about the realities of the present and its implications for the future. Eight months into Biden's presidency, what is the state of polarization in the United States today? Are we healing our national divides or are existing rifts only deepening or are new ones forming? And what does that mean for our nation moving forward? Here to discuss is a fabulous panel of experts from the world of politics and polling. Daniel Cox is a senior fellow in polling and public opinion at the American Enterprise Institute and the director of the Survey Center on American Life. He specializes in survey research, politics, youth culture, and identity and religion. Before joining AEI, he was the research director of the Public Religion Research Institute, which he co-founded and where he led the organization's qualitative and quantitative research program. He's also the, author, the co-author of numerous academic book chapter, chapters, journal articles, and conference papers on topics relating to religious polarization and he's a contributor to 538 and Business Insider. William Galston holds the Ezra K. Zilka Chair in the Brookings Institution's Governance Studies Program, where he serves as a senior fellow. Prior to January 20, 2006, he was the Saul Stern Professor and Acting Dean at the School of Public Policy, the University of Maryland, Director of the Institute for Philosophy and Public Policy, Founding Director of the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement, and Executive Director of the National Commission on Civic Renewal. His books include Anti-Pluralism, the Populist Threat to Liberal Democracy, and the Practice of Liberal Pluralism. And then finally, uh, as far as the panelists are concerned, William Crystal is editor-at-large of The Bulwark. He was a founder of The Weekly Standard and is a regular guest on leading political commentary shows. Prior to his work at The Weekly Standard, Crystal led the Project for the Republican Future, an organization that helped shape the strategy that produced the 1994 Republican congressional victory. Before coming to Washington, Crystal taught politics at the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard University. I'm now delighted to hand the mic over to uh, a representative from this panel's co-sponsoring organization, Braveler Angels. As an organization dedicated to pulling our nation from the brink of complete fracture, one conversation at a time, we couldn't think of a more natural partnership for this event. Luke, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Nicole, and thank you, American Purpose, not only for being such excellent partners and for the opportunity to co-sponsor this event, but also for putting on this fantastic and timely conference. And uh, in the meantime, welcome all Braver Angels grassroots members calling in to American Purpose's Continuing Liberty per uh, Conference. A quick note, uh, please keep yourself on mute over the duration of this call, and we, when we get to the Q&A towards the end, please feel free to use your Zoom hands function to ask questions. Meantime, the chat box is open, so as you have thoughts and questions uh, over the course of this event, uh, feel free to use that throughout. My name is Luke Nathan Phillips, and I am the Publius Fellow for Public Discourse at Braver Angels, and for the past six months or so, we've worked with American Purpose to put on events as part of our America's Public Forum series. We look forward to co-sponsoring many more events with American Purpose in the coming months. Stay tuned. But for now, I'd like to introduce the work of Braver Angels and our host for this panel. 
Braver Angels is the nation's largest fully red, blue, and grassroots-led civic organization dedicated to the work of helping Americans of all backgrounds find and appreciate the value in each other across all of our great social, political, and ideological divides. We work to build a house united. This is work on the sidelines of politics, but with intrinsically political implications. So we take the work of polarization and depolarization very seriously, and we do it our best in our workshop and debate programs, but Intellectual and social science work has always been crucial to our work as well, so it's a pleasure to host some great minds in conversation to help us all consider the nature of America's present situation. There is no better individual to host this conversation today, I think, than my colleague and friend John Wood Jr., National Ambassador at Braver Angels, co-host of the Braver Angels podcast, former congressional candidate and former vice chairman of the Republican Party of Los Angeles County. He's written uh, at quite a few places and showed up on quite a few shows covering topics in moral philosophy, racial reconciliation, and the underappreciated theme of patriotic empathy. And I might add, he is a very talented and soulful musician and a very good and soulful friend. John spearheads the work of depolarization in some of the most polarizing environments, but for today, we're quite happy to have him, have him spearheading that work right here in the Friendly Vital Center at American Purpose. So John, uh, let's hand it off to you. Thank you very much, Luke. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to have a designated hype man for anybody who doesn't have Luke Phillips in their life ready to get folks excited to hang on your every word. I highly recommend uh, that you get one. So Luke, thank you very much. And thank you so much uh, to our many friends at American Purpose uh, here in the audience and uh, to our esteemed panel. So very grateful to be in, in dialogue with all of you. So I expect that the time is just going to fly by here. We don't have too much of it to begin with. So let's, let's, let's jump in. Um, you know, thinking about the question of polarization, it occurs to me that, you know, since I was a kid in the 1990s, you know, I was born in, born in 86, I was always interested in politics. Since I was a kid in the 1990s, I, I can remember people talking about the decline of American civic norms or inability to govern properly and relate to each other properly. And back then it was lament over the, the Monica Lewinsky scandal, the impeachment of President Bill Clinton, the battles between Clinton and Gingrich and so forth. And over the course of time, the Iraq war, the Bush administration, then the Obama administration battles with the Tea Party, um, things seem to continue to decline. And yet all of those episodes seem like conventional sorts of generic parts of our memory at this point. Uh, Bill Galston, I was looking at a, a couple of minutes of you presenting uh, some, some work from a Brookings Institution report wherein you guys were making recommendations in terms of how we could address polarization through engaging some of the conventional sorts of levers of governance, changes that could be made to, to the, the voting system, to the way in which Congress functions and so forth. Back in those times, government shutdowns, 2013, the Obama administration seemed to represent the sort of nadir of institutional dysfunction in American politics. Fast forward to 2021, a government shutdown almost seems like a breath of relief when contrasted with our inability to respond to a public health crisis, our massive demographic uh, uh, divisions, et cetera, et cetera. My question for all of you is, how is our understanding of polarization changed over the course of the last several years. Um, is it the case that the old formulas for understanding polarization as being merely a consequence of the ideological siloing of the political parties and maybe the perverse incentives of the media structure no longer quite cut it in describing just where we are at? in terms of the deep-seatedness of America's divisions and the faltering of our institutional society. So I'd love to throw that ball out for anybody who would like to uh, uh, catch it. Um, would anybody like to take a swing at that, uh, at that opening salvo? If there are no immediate takes, I will call on people. Okay, Bill Crystal, you are it. <sighs> Yeah, no, I think they, I mean, it has changed. I was thinking about this, you know, just a few minutes ago as we were preparing for this. Uh, Bill Galson and I did a project together in the New Center in 2017. It issued, issued a bunch of recommendations. I think what, what we showed is that it's not that hard, not as impossible as people thought at the time, to overcome partisanship in the sense of coming up with 
centrist solutions to various issues, immigration, uh, big tech, uh, many others, um, policy issues. It's not, the, the, the gaps are not unbridgeable. Looking back at that document, four years later, I think it was released around, around now in 2017, the first year of the Trump presidency, it looks antique in a way, because we're not even, I mean, we're not debating in Congress big policy issues, and the problem is that we can't get to, to the center, you know, and that it's tricky to, we're, we're beyond ordinary partisanship is the way I would put it, and we're now into a kind of effective polarization that has spilled out from the political parties, from Congress, uh, all over the country at the state level. Bill and I did something in Berkeley. When was that, Bill? 2018 or 19? I can't remember. We did a, a panel discussion there together. And Bill had a formulation, I think it was yours, that was good at that time. We were talking about how bad is the partisanship. And I think the formulation, how did it compare with the late 60s, 70s? And I think Bill said, well, DC is probably worse than it was back then, more dysfunctional, more hyperpartisan, uh, a more toxic kind of combination of gridlock and 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 partisanship. But the country is healthier. We don't. It's not like the late '60s. We're not having riots everywhere. Uh, you look at state and local governments back then; they were functioning. There were a lot of moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans governing pretty well. Cities seem to be, you know, doing things and so forth. I don't know that one can really say that now. There's still some of that going on. But so the polarization, in my view, I think we've gone beyond the more conventional political science-y hyper-partisanship to a real cultural sociological effect of polarization. Maybe it started in Congress and in DC and with President Trump, and, and uh, but now it's it's everywhere. And you can see it, of course, on vaccines and masks and the election lie and so forth. Two tiny instances, um, just as today, as I'm thinking about this. So on the policy side, there's a there were proposals for police reform. And there were negotiations for months. Tim Scott on the Republican side, Cory Booker on the Democratic side, others. Totally mad. This is a classic thing. The differences, as I understand it, I'm no expert, were not great. The differences are not great. Everyone sort of wanted to come to a deal. You're talking about very small differences in the way in which the federal government would make would judge certain police, you know, make certain things public about certain police departments and and qualified immunity. I mean, we're we're talking pretty technical stuff that could have been worked out. And it wasn't. It was interesting. It broke apart. That, that strikes me as a sort of minor but sort of symbolic sense that we can't come to agreement on anything in Washington. It's so toxic. And the one thing they came to agreement on, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, a little easier to come to agreement if you're spending a lot of money. Uh, in the Senate, they got, what, 19, I think, Republican votes. Uh, this morning, also, the House Republican leadership announced that it was whipping against the bill. Think about that for 19, two-fifths of the Republicans in the Senate were for it. Uh, it's quite normal for the House Republican leadership to say we're going to oppose it. Most Republicans in the Senate did too, but they would to whip it and not to assume there'd be 50 or 60 Republican votes in the House for it. And that has a huge effect, just without getting into the weeds of congressional you know, procedure in a way. Obviously, if you've got 50 Republican votes for it, the Democrats could afford to lose 40 or 50 left-wing progressive Democrats against it. And so suddenly you have a classic center-out coalition which could pass this legislation and could be a model for other legislation. But no, if the entire Republican Party is against it, then eight, five progressives, I guess, in the House can veto the legislation and suddenly you've got a whole different dynamic. So the degree of partisanship, hyper-partisanship, the spillover of the polarization into the society, the culture, the, the election lies, uh, the pandemic, I, th I think we're in a very different place than we were five or six years ago. I mean, we weren't in a great place five or six years ago. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. Um, it's very helpful here to, to get us going. And uh, Bill Galston, I'd be curious to know if, if, you, um, if, if, if you recognize this transition that Bill and, and, and myself sort of pointed to from sort of a, a framework for understanding polarization that is you know, ideological morphing into something that is more deeply sociological and cultural. Uh, does that resonate with you? And to add a just a, a little element uh, specifically for your, yourself, because I know that you've been an innovative uh, and a leading voice in our sort of communitarian um, understanding of, of democratic society. Uh, is there a connection in the background here between the decline and sort of communitarian sentiments in American politics? And this, this transition that we are experiencing now, perhaps, into something that is more deeply culturally, sociologically pernicious than it was before? Uh, 
regrettably, uh, I have to agree with everything that I've just heard. Uh, and I'm going, to be, I'm going to be intentionally terse here because I wanna leave lots of time for the discussion to develop. But I believe that we're closer to being two Americas than we have been perhaps since the end of the Civil War. Two Americas defined by not, ju not just or even primarily ideology, uh, but by different experiences and different reactions to those experiences. This didn't begin yesterday, uh, but as of now, uh, here's one heuristic. The country is pretty evenly divided between people who think that we are a better country now than we were 60 years ago and those who believe exactly the reverse. Uh, I could go through a long side-by-side -side comparison of these two Americas and I have in different articles. There's not time for that now, but suffice it to say uh, that uh, you have one set of sentiments if you live in rural or small town America. You have a completely different set of sentiments if you live in urban or suburban America. And so there, you know, there has been a clustering along lines of geography, of fundamental experiences with the, with the economy, uh, with the culture, and with the polity. Uh, and what we are dealing with now is the fruit of decades of development of these two Americas in different directions. Uh, and now I would, uh, just one more point. Uh, I remember the shock of election night on 2016, uh, as if it were just yesterday. And what was shocking about it? It wasn't so much that Hillary Clinton lost. It was, I think, the sudden revelation that one half of the country, the half that I happen to belong to, was fundamentally deeply ignorant of the existence and the sentiments of the other half of the country. And you know, this is, you know, this this led to you know, frantic months of what I'll call media anthropology. You know, when major news organizations sent reporters out to Heartland America. You know, the way, you know, the way some, some countries used to send out explorers and missionaries, <laughs> because, you know, we, we, suddenly un, we suddenly understood that we were not only ignorant, but culpably ignorant of the way of life and the sentiments of tens of millions of our fellow citizens. That was a sign of the breach of the gap, in my judgment. Details to come. I saw a great political cartoon to that effect, uh, Bill Galston, where I forget the publication, but they had a showed, showed a diner filled with reporters and suits and ties with expensive cameras and microphones, putting them in front of folks who were you know, wearing overalls and trucker hats and so forth, sort of asking for their asking for their, you know, their their insights in terms of the America that they that they couldn't see. Right. Um, yep. It's, it's a remarkable thing. Uh, Dan Cox, though, I um, two, two questions for you, my friend. Uh, number one, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you have sort of uh, quantitative insights in terms of you know, how polling and research may sort of bear out the intensifying of these, um, these, these political divides, uh, the polarization that we're experiencing currently, and if there are any sorts of landmark moments um, wherein that data shifts in ways that are that are particularly revealing. The other question I have, though, is I almost wonder if Bill's, um, Bill Galston's uh, framing here of us living in two Americas 
isn't almost too optimistic and too, and too simple in a sense, because I think that one could easily make the case that we might be living in maybe four Americas. I mean, the truth is, is that not only is the warfare between the parties as stark as, as, as uh, Bill and Bill laid out to be, but even within the parties, when you look at sort of, you know, the social justice um, activist um, wing of the Democratic Party versus, I guess you could say, the sort of neoliberal sort of Biden establishment wing. And then you look at the Republican Party, the, the now Trump populist base of the GOP versus uh, a mainstream of the party that may vote Trump, but still perhaps represent a different sort of social and political bearing. So much of the ricketiness of our institutions and our political parties, I think, has to do with internal divides internal to the parties that are themselves, perhaps, almost without recent precedent. So I'd love for you to, to take on those, those, those two parts of it and give us your, give us your take. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really hard to be an optimist in this space. And uh, man, I thought I was pessimistic until I heard Bill. Uh, and I think a lot of that rings true, particularly if you spend a lot of time looking at polling results, looking at divisions over education and race and, and politics, uh, the news is not great. And there's, you know, there's new evidence coming out every day. There's a new paper that was published this, this month that shows that political polarization is even infecting the socialization process. So how we come to think about our political identity as children, how we come to our political values. Um, and a couple of prominent political scientists looked at what was happening in the 60s and 70s uh, in terms of how we were, were gaining those ideas and, and coming to those attitudes and, and identities and what's happening now. And what's happening is that the, the polarization process uh, and this idea of, of political disaffection that we really don't like the other side or we fear them um, is, is becoming a part of how we become to these identities. So children are becoming more uh, ha having greater political animus to, to the opposing party. They're learning it from their parents. Uh, and that's a pretty scary state, I think, when you think about um, how hard in those, those ideas and those ideologies can become. But uh, the other thing I think about this is, is, is absolutely right. Um, when uh, we talk about the way that this is not just differences over policy issues, we, we've, we've well, past that point. Uh, and, and we see it in our personal lives. We see it in polling. Like I don't poll exclusively politics or exclusively horse race stuff. Like the center focuses on everyday experiences, how Americans are living their lives, how they're, you know, how they live in their communities, the things that they care about. We, we pull on things like marriage and dating and friendship, but you see politics he been in all these domains. So in a poll we conducted in 2020, we found that politics was increasingly an important part of, of dating and how people were making romantic decisions about who they would consider uh, you know, an agreeable potential romantic partner. Trump, views of Trump were really high on the list. That was among the most, like the highest, um, particularly for liberals. But we saw, you know, we saw those issues for both Democrats and Republicans. When you look at, at the, the sort of natures of our social circles. Like we, we know the concept of homophily, this idea that we want to be around people with similar backgrounds, whether race, uh, religion, class, you know, this is a, a natural human tendency, but we're seeing it increasingly in politics too, that, that our, our friends tend to mirror and reflect our own political predilections. Um, in fact, we did a, a major study on social networks, looking at sort of the, the people that are closest to you, sort of the, the, the inner social circle. And among both Democrats and Republicans, a majority of people in that group uh, had the same political preferences. And so again, we're seeing this uh, again and again. The, the last example I'll give, we have a new study coming out uh, that looks at how people are living in their neighborhood. And, and one of the things we asked about is, you know, what is your perception of the politics of people in your neighborhood? And what we found was that people who perceived that the, their neighbors had political views similar to their own were much more likely to trust their neighbors, much more likely to, to seek out support, uh, had much more positive views about their neighborhood. So at all, at all these different levels and, and in all these different ways, we really see this, this political polarization operative in daily life. And that's really concerning, right? It's one thing you say, say okay, you know, differences over immigration or abortion um, or policing, right? That's sort of relegated to the, the political space. 
And we have heated conversations there, but it's increasingly infecting just our everyday lives. And I think that's, that's to me, um, fairly troubling. Uh, John? Yes, sir. Bill, go ahead. Let me just drop, let me just drop a quick footnote to that. Uh, people of a certain age in this session will remember a film, I believe it was from the late 1960s called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Hmm. Uh, anybody who's seen that film will remember uh, that a young white woman brought home an African-American, uh, you know, you know, boyfriend, I can't remember, boyfriend, fiance, at any rate, great shock and consternation in an allegedly liberal you know, family, family of parents. Well, today, according to a poll that came out just earlier this week, 94% of Americans approve of interracial marriage, you know, up from single digits when they started asking the question, if they remade that film today, it would be that same young woman, you know, bringing home a young woman, a young man wearing a MAGA hat. Mm -hmm. You know, the you know the axis of division has shifted enormously during this period, uh, and you know politics like a noxious gas, you know, has infused every unoccupied space and some occupied ones as well, and it has become nearly ubiquitous. This is not a good sign. Mm. It reminds me of a, satir of a uh, uh, satirical YouTube video I saw uh, sort of recently where you had a young man who sat his parents down in the living room and he said, Mom, Dad, I have to tell you something. It's time I finally come out uh, <laughs> the closet and, and let you know the truth. And, and they were so supportive and warm and welcoming, just waiting to hear about his alternative lifestyle to embrace him for who he was until he disappointed them, not by saying that he was gay, but that he was, in fact, a Republican. And, <laughs> you know, turned, uh, <laughs> turned left from there. There you have it. Um, so, that, so, that's where we're, so that's where we're at. Um, I do want to, you brought up uh, Guess Who's Coming to get Dinner, that, that great role, Sidney Poitier, and so forth. You know, it does occur to me that we're in a moment where the demographic diversification of American society has to be a deep part of the context for our divisions. And I think that it's not just a matter uh, of there being, you know, more folks immigrating to America, that, that you have, you know, the what has always been a white majority in America, perhaps on its way to becoming a plurality, that it's not so much a matter of horizontal diversification as much as it is, as it is perhaps also a matter of vertical integration, uh, uh, vertical diversification, meaning that you not only have more and more voices in American society, but you have more and more different voices in the boardroom, right? More and more voices of influence within the institutions from the academy to Hollywood and politics. And that seems to bring with it narratives that challenge, you know, uh, previously sort of perhaps sacred understandings of American identity, such as what you, I suppose, get in the context of something like the 1619 Project, for instance, which very quickly seem to mainstream, at least within sort of progressive circles, a, a much more sort of, you know, critical and sort of identity oriented analysis of American history than what had been the case before. I'm wondering um, if, if you gentlemen have, have particular feelings on this sort of, what I think is, you know, in part sort of an organic collision of worldviews in institutional spaces culture shocks that we just sort of hadn't really experienced before in a quite as visceral a way. How is the, how is, how are the, the, the ethnic and identity narratives, you know, coming into contact with traditional ways of looking at American society, playing into this larger landscape of polarization, you know, during and after the, the Trump administration? Maybe, let me oh. say a word on it, because maybe I'll, I'll be a little contrarian on this. I mean, I think there's some truth, obviously, to what, to that point. And, and, and some aspects of, of identity politics that exacerbate divisions and polarization. But you can also make it the argument the opposite way, honestly. I mean, we have a lot of data on intermarriage just to be, begin with a very factual question. And basically, it seems to me it's not down. If anything, it's up among different ethnic groups, different racial groups, uh, much higher than it was, when, as, as, as the example Bill mentioned suggests from the 60s. And, and incidentally, fewer objections to it. 
among different groups, including among quite polarized types on, on the right and, and, and the left. And, and so do this experiment, Bill mentioned the guy with the MAGA hat. I mean, isn't there a bigger gap between highly educated professionals, you know, on the coast uh, in terms of their views of any of either race or any race or any ethnicity and working class uh, Americans who feel totally neglected, as Bill was saying earlier, by those elites, leaving totally aside the merits on this. I mean, race is way exceptional, I would say, because it's always been exceptional in America. But I think in, uh, we saw the Hispanic vote move to Trump. Why? Because it turns out that a kind of working class, small business, anti-socialism, somewhat anti-identity politic types of Hispanics, incidentally, a third of whose kids are marrying non-Hispanics, and they don't even, it's not even a huge deal to them necessarily to keep Latino identity alive. Obviously, they want it to be respected and, and taken uh, seriously. You know, those people moved right to Trump. So they turned out to have a little more in common with the famous white working class <laughs> than they did with, you know, uh, much more, quote, tolerant and uh, you know, upper middle class uh, academics who were very attentive to Latinx uh, uh, um, concerns. So I, you know, I, I wish in a certain way, if it were, if it were just, it sounds crazy to say, since race has been such an unbelievably difficult thing for America for centuries, but if it were just race, color, ethnicity, I kind of think we could work that out, honestly. What is sort of war, not scarier exactly, but makes it harder to put your arms around it in a way is the degree to which we're now at a kind of cultural sociological divide that doesn't seem quite uh, reducible to these things that uh, more concrete, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, differences we have. Hmm. I'm tempted. I mean, but no, I'd say education. I mean, I mean, isn't it true? I defer to the to, to Dan and Bill on this. Um, they've seen the data. They've studied the data much more. I mean, the single best predictor now, with a slight again exception of, of African Americans, uh, is, is is education in terms of uh, actual voting. Right? I mean, you know, I mean, the gulf between the uh, the grad grad school graduate grad the PhDs and the and the no college is a greater gulf than all the other regional ethnic and you know, economic gulfs that we that we know about. So that the, we are, it's sort of, it's, I don't know if it's two Americas exactly, but it's two very different experiences of the 21st century, of change in America, of how the, what the future heralds, of what kind of society we want to live in and so forth. Well, let's engage that combined frame really quick, because you're right, Bill, uh, there, there's this tendency, of course, to want to sort of look at the, the, the proper way of understanding polarization is either being sort of a partisan matter or a racial matter or some overlap there. But you introduced the dynamic of the factor of class um, to that mix, class and educational team, of course, tending to correspond uh, uh, very tightly to that. Uh, perhaps we arrive at a more clarifying way of understanding um, this reality. Um, Dan Cox, and then I'll jump back to you, Bill Galston. Uh, do you wanna weigh in on this point um, how useful um, are the, what is the relationship between, between the frames of race and class and understanding the reality of polarization in this moment? And is there a coherent way in which we can understand these factors in tandem on this question? Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate this, this sort of uh, direction of the conversation. And, you know, one of the things that, that frustrates me is, is how much credit Trump gets for, you know, the increasing racial polarization in the U.S., but that was actually, if you look at attitudes like feelings towards immigrants, uh, attitudes about Muslims, we saw the polarization actually occur during the Obama years. Uh, and there's been some political science uh, research that suggests, you know, that the Tea Party was a part of this, right? The, it, you know, the Tea Party, when you, when you look at them, I think uh, Theta Scotch Pole is like the biggest proponent of this view, but it was not just a group of disgruntled uh, libertarians, but uh, a group that was animated by, among other things, you know, anti-immigrant sentiment. And so Pew finds that if you look at where Republicans were in 2009, 49% said that Islam was more likely than other religions to, to encourage and promote violence. And by 2015, that number had jumped from 49% to 67%. And by 2016, it edged up to 75%, but it did not budge during the Trump years. So that, that polarization on that issue had already occurred. Um, but I think, I think Bill Crystal is absolutely right that, that there's a complicating aspect of this, particularly if you look uh, at, at the Democratic Party and the coalition that uh, wins some elections, you know, it includes a lot more culturally conservative people of color. 
And you see this, and you saw this in the 2020 election, uh, where Biden underperformed uh, Hillary on a, a number of different, uh, uh, particularly southern states, among Hispanics. And I think the some analysis after that that, that I saw that I, that I find quite convincing, given my own research, is that that Biden's poor performance among Hispanics in, in these certain states was was largely due. Uh, to the party's positioning on the, the sort of defund the police question and, and some related issues. Uh, and we see it in, you know, in my data, and I think it's bear, borne out in other places too, that Hispanic men in particular um, are quite opposed to defunding the police and have more concerted attitudes on, on racial policies generally. And even among Black Amer Americans, attitudes about policing and, and the police are complicated. Uh, again, we have a new study that's coming out shortly and so uh, what we found was kind of um, some, some dissonance, but actually that makes some sense. So while Black Americans may remain critical of, of you know, some police practices and, and the police overall, there's less, there's less trust. Um, they at the same time prefer greater police presence in their own neighborhoods, as do uh, Hispanic Americans much more so than whites. And in part, that's, that's due to their lived experiences. Like a lot of these uh, groups also say that they feel less safe in their neighborhoods, the, you know, crime is more of a factor. And so the, the desire for a greater police presence makes a certain amount of sense. It's, it's borne out by their, their lived experience. Um, but it's a reality that I think some democratic elites haven't really uh, understood fully that, that there is some amount of, of ideological diversity, at least on these cultural questions uh, that, that really is important to pay attention to. I think that's well said. And you know, it's, um... It's, it struck me for a while that there is this sort of parallel diagonal condescension, if you will, that runs from, I suppose you might say, privileged quarters uh, on, on the right and the left towards the other side's poor, to put it sort of simply, or towards the other side's working class, wherein, you know, I mean, African Americans, Black people, and other people of color are frequently used to hearing you know, conservative analysts and business people and so forth making the points making points that you know if only these folks would start working harder not having babies out of wedlock not shooting each other and so forth all of their problems would be solved and we wouldn't have to worry about these big policy conversations over redistribution there's a condescension that you sort of observe there that goes diagonal over the parties and you know from from upper class to, to lower class but then on the other side you've got you know privileged sort of, you know, liberal cultural elites in the university and in the universities and the entertainment uh, industry, well, I think make it very clear that, you know, in, 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 in all sorts of ways, when we think about the people we want representing America, when we think about the multicultural panorama that we would like to be the face of American society, there may be room for some white people in there, but we're not talking about poor white people. We're not talking about working class, religious, you know, conservative white people. We're not talking about rural folks. These aren't the folks that we really value in our universities or want to put in our TV shows, except maybe it's the backwards looking sort of bonehead or, you know, bully, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so Bill Galston, I almost wonder if there's not sort of a hopeful frame to be put on this insofar as, you know, maybe Bill Crystal is is right. Maybe there is there is commonality that lies between working class Americans across the partisan and the cultural divide, that if we were to able to sort of earnestly and authentically speak to it, uh, might create the preconditions uh, for something of a coming together of otherwise very polarized groups, um, you know, in some social and political relationship that can recenter our conversation on lifting up the most vulnerable in society in a way that doesn't cause us to pick and choose who we value along, you know, sort of racial and partisan categories. But what do you think? Well, I think there's a lot to that. And you know, in an article that I did for the American Purpose a couple of months ago called The Bitter Heartland, I tried to put myself in the shoes of people who believe, I think with considerable justice, that they've been on a losing side culturally uh, and economically, and to some extent politically as well, in, in recent decades. And let me, let me just give you one fact that illustrates the problem better than any other that I can come up with. Uh, the number of manufacturing jobs in the United States essentially remained flat 
during the 1990s in the range of 18 million. Okay. In the six years after China's accession to the WTO and before the start of the Great Recession, we lost all at once 3 million manufacturing jobs. And by the end of the Great Recession, we'd lost another 2.3. So in the period of less than a decade, we'd lost more than one third of our manufacturing employment. And if there was a lot of discussion about that at that time, I don't remember it. Mm. This was a cataclysm you know, for small towns across the heartland, which were dependent you know, for a lot of their economic livelihood on the supply chains that descended from the manufacturing centers into the smaller towns and even the rural areas. If you look at the supply chains for automobiles, for example, there were lots of parts manufacturers who were driven out of business during this period. Uh, and similarly for the inputs into, into steel and aluminum, et cetera. Uh, and the replacement of the manufacturing economy with the information economy was the replacement of an economy that had deep roots in the heartland with one that essentially had no geographical or economic connection with the heartland at all. Who was taking the side of those 5.3 million displaced manufacturing workers during that period? Uh, within, within the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, as they were then constituted, almost nobody did. And I could line up examples like that, you know, to illustrate how the neglect of this great economic divide, which was also a cultural divide, you know, helped to create a permissive environment for the widening of the divisions that we're now discussing. Hmm. Indeed. Um, I, I think that I think that that's that's powerful and resonates with a lot of my own thinking, to be sure. And Bill Crystal, uh, I welcome you to pick up on that thread or any of the other threads we have on out on the table. But I do, before we move to Q and A, want to throw another uh, uh, topic at you, which I think we have to engage, uh, which is the subject of the present administration, um, President Biden. And uh, I, I'll frame it, I'll, I'll set it up like this. I, I think that there was, um, there was a uh, sort of a Biden promise, if you will, uh, a, a promise to the idea of Joe Biden, which said that, you know, he was an old hand in the US Senate. He's somebody who has had deep longstanding relationships with politicians and leaders on either side of the aisle. Uh, nobody would look to Joe Biden for innovative new sorts of ways of thinking about government or politics, but after so much unrest and, and disruption and chaos, frankly, uh, that sort of came as a relief. I think that there was a hope that Biden, who leaned into a, uh, into a language of unity, you know, could restore a sense of normalcy, maybe working with Mitch McConnell, with whom he has a longstanding relationship, and that the beginning of the Biden administration could represent a closing of closing of the book, if you will, on the chaos that had become, you know, just so, I mean, whether you, you support them or not, but the chaos that had become so routine in the Trump administration that we could begin to pivot back to something like normal. And I, I feel as if that is not quite the case and that things frankly still feel not only chaotic, but that the social, um, obviously the social ruptures that President Biden stepped into have not really abated under the influence of his, you know, rhetorical and, and governmental presence. And so my question to you is, you know, what, what, has, what, what has the reality of the Biden administration and the Biden style of governing been? And what does it say for our prospects of ever returning to anything like normal, assuming that that's what we want and that normal can be can be defined? What do you say to that? I think, I mean, I think Biden's done most of what he promised to do or tried to do most of what he promised to do. And there are things I would have done differently and all that, but honestly, it's not a left-wing cabinet. It's He's not uh, proposing to expand the size of the Supreme Court or or produce you know massive socialism in America or defund the police, all the things that 
Democrats were accused of in 2020. I can't, there's so many other things he was allegedly going to do. All my Republican friends would tell me when I when they went on when, when I said I was supporting Biden, he you know turned against Israel and one thing after another. And I think having a in a very closely divided Congress, having a and country, having a Republican Party that is except for the one instance of Senate Republicans on infrastructure, honestly, uh, that's just unwilling to work with him makes it, he then has to get 50 votes. And that means he's hostage in the Senate and 218 in the House, which means he is more hostage, ironically, to the progressives than he would otherwise be. And also the, uh, the Republican just willingness to exploit every, you know, cultural, you know, uh, issue that's possibly out there. I don't know, has Joe Biden ever said the words critical race theory? Is the Biden Education Department doing anything about it? No. Are different localities, maybe if pushing it a little, not that much, honestly, but some professors talked about it, yes. But every time one place somewhere, somewhere, some eighth grade is reading something that maybe they shouldn't be reading, the Republicans, Fox Party, well, Fox News above all, but the whole Republican conservative right-wing ecosystem, and a lot of elected Republicans, I would also say, just that's their, that's their moment. And that's what the left is, and that's what the Democratic Party is. And then a few Democrats have to say, well, wait a second. I mean, it's not so inappropriate to assign a little bit of our race in some of our classrooms, you know? And then suddenly we're off to that to that culture war. And Biden maybe could do more to shut it down. Occasionally, I wish he came down harder on the left wing of his party and so forth. But, uh, you know, I really think this is when you have one party, and not just party, one political movement, ideological movement, media ecosystem that is just determined to exacerbate every divide, to pour, pour salt in every wound, you know, very hard for the other people to do much except either fight back or occasionally try to preempt. You know, he, he held on the vaccine stuff, on the mask stuff. I think if anything, he held back longer than he should have, honestly, in pursuing what really are good policies that will save lives. Because, you know, everyone wanted to be understanding of all these people who were so uncertain about the vaccine and allegedly acting in good faith. When you have governors, the two Republican governors of the, the largest states that have Republican governors, the second and third largest states in the country, Texas and Florida, behaving the way at least rhetorically they're behaving and practice as well. Uh, what's going to happen? Abortion, very divisive issue. Biden administration, unequivocal, unequivocally on one side. I wish there were more pro Hyde Amendment Democrats and more pro life Democrats personally. Having said that, who, who polarized that issue? Now there's a bill that's going to, Pelosi's going to bring up. Why is she bringing up a bill to codify at the federal level Roe v. Wade? Because of what the Republicans did in Texas. And why did the Republicans do what they did in Texas? Because they really think they're going to save a lot of unborn, the lives of unborn children in Texas? I don't believe that for a minute, because they thought this was a way to polarize to their advantage with this crazy, you know, bounty system and stuff. So I, I put much more of the blame on the Republicans, honestly, and on the right wing at this point then on Biden. And, you know, I'm happy to criticize progressives, but uh, it, it, the right loves having the progressives be the face of the Democratic Party, even though in every Democratic primary in 2021, the more moderate, basically, in every one, I think, the more moderate candidate has won. And so I, I, I'm very, uh, I think it's a very tough situation for the Biden administration. I just you know, drop a footnote here, John. Yes, by all means. Uh, if anyone had predicted 20 years ago that there would be a Biden administration, and I would be more critical of that administration than Bill Crystal, uh, the entire <laughs> the entire audience would have laughed. Uh, but let let me let me just put my reservation this way. By all means, uh, Biden, in the course of his presidential campaign put out two promises in tension with each other, which he didn't try to reconcile during the campaign and hasn't really been able to reconcile since. On the one hand, you know, he told his fellow Democrats that he would govern from the center of the Democratic Party. On the other hand, he told independents and moderate Republicans that he would govern as most as best he could from the center of the country. Those are not the same promises. And, uh, and I don't think it's any accident that he's lost a little bit of support among Democrats during his recent precipitous plunge in the party, but he has hemorrhaged independents, the people who were drawn 
to the governed from the center of the country uh, message. Now, it may be that it was a foolish message to send because as Bill suggested, maybe there is no center of the country or not much of one left to govern from under current circumstances of partisan polarization. But in that case, I think it was a big mistake to generate expectations in the crucial swing part of the population that that kind of governance was possible because those people are now disappointed. Their expectations are not being met. And it's not clear to me that the current orientation of the Biden administration is calculated to correct uh, that, you know, that problem or to staunch the bleeding. Mm. Indeed. But of course, politicians do campaign to win and promising to govern from the center of the, of the country in a national election, of course, is something that presidential candidates typically do. But I will say that if Bill Kristol is right and President Biden has governed responsibly and communicated responsibly, you know, on, on, on the whole, in some sense, that makes the situation seem all the more all the more dire. But I will turn it over uh, to our audience to give us some input as to whether or not we think that is that is actually actually the case. So quick round of applause for our speakers. I'm giving you guys the sign language, the Zoom language uh, ovation here uh, for Bill, Bill and Dan. And we are going to continue the conversation, bringing bringing you all in. And I think that we have what uh, 20 minutes, a little less. So let me just lay down a, a quick uh, quick couple of ground rules. Um, or really, there's only there's only one. Try and keep your questions concise. Try not to go beyond about 30 seconds or so. Uh, if it turns into a big monologue that tries to smuggle a question in it, it, at the end of it, with all apologies, I will cut you off. Um, I am bloviating. I talk way too much. My monologues never end. But that is the privilege of the host, folks. This is not a democracy. I'm sorry to say it. Uh, but with that said, um, eager to get you all in. So uh, go ahead and raise your Zoom hands or your physical hands. I will go first to Dorsey Cartwright. Dorsey, unmute yourself and ask your question. Feel free to direct it to one of our speakers in particular if you choose. Um, I'm actually interested in, in everybody's response. So whoever feels drawn. Um, I was struck when I heard that um, McCarty is whipping against the bipartisan bill. And uh, my question has to do with, given that this bipartisan bill was worked down diligently by both parties over a period of time as an ex excellently de designed bill it passed in the Senate, and now we're seeing all the polarization attacking it. What, what do you think can be done at this very time to support that bill going through. Given all the things everyone's talked about, what can be done? Outstanding, thank you, Dorsey. Uh, do we have an answer to that question? Well, I'll, I'm, I'm not I'm sure. Sorry, but, no. Okay, yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not really following it hour to hour on the Hill. Look, I think McCarthy can whip it, but about 30, 50, 70 House Republicans can still vote for it and they should hear from I believe others in the country who might be inclined to support them, uh, if they're you know uh, uh, less Trumpy Republicans, frankly, but uh, uh, and maybe just less right wing Republicans in some respects, uh, they should hear that there'll be some support for them. I mean, it's it's a bit of a catch twenty two. The, the the moderate Republicans are, or the non Trump Republicans are very weak. Uh, in Congress, but especially in the House, and uh, because they're weak, no one bothers to think they can be, they can be rallied. They've disappointed people in the past, I would say, and when this would hopes they would break from Trump, though they can't, or from the, you know, the the the, 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 the extreme part of the party, let's call it, or the, the base of the party, maybe. But in this case, it seems to me there's no, yeah, this is a little easier. You have 19, 19 Republican senators, I think it was 19, voted for it. They, there are congressmen in each of those states, I'm going to say almost all of them. Uh, they could be told, hey, your congressman voted for it. If you're a congressman from Kentucky, Mitch McConnell voted for it. Is it really that bad a bill? So this is a case where maybe this is a good test of the White House. Do they have the ability to get business types to lobby Republican members in a, an effective way that speaks to Republicans. Here, I do think there's been a bit of a problem with the Biden administration to get back to the last discussion. They're not that good at, I mean, I think their policies mostly are, aren't that radical, I think. They're not very good at explaining to Republicans in a Republican friendly way why Republicans should like some of those policies. And it'll be interesting to see how much of an attempt there is to have 
you know, to rally. The Chamber of Commerce, I believe, supported the bipartisan bill. Will they get the chamber? Will, is Buttigieg on the phone right now? Clover, you know, the various senior people in the cabinet, uh, Ron Klain, president himself on the phone to the chamber saying, hey, okay, you say you want to work with us. We got this bill that you wanted. We got, thank you for getting 19 Republican votes in the Senate. Could you get us some Republican votes in the House and help Pelosi out a little bit from having to give the progressives more than she wants to? Indeed, and Bill Galson, I, I saw you leaning forward. Did you want to add to? Uh, did you want to add to this uh, question? Well, I, as one of the co-founders of No Labels, uh, I, <laughs> I right. note uh, your backdrop, Dorsey. Uh, I have a lot to say about this, but I'm afraid that if each of us answers each question, we won't really have time for a lot of questions. Okay. So all I, all I can say is there is. There is at least one organization that is in daily contact uh, with persuadable House Republicans, with the Chamber of Commerce, with the Business Roundtable, doing exactly what Bill is urging someone to do. Uh, and the White, the White House is very much aware of these efforts. I'm increasingly doubtful that these efforts will suffice in current circumstances. And the announce, today's announcement about the minority leader is genuinely bad news for bipartisanship. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Moving now to Frank DeStefano. Uh, Frank, go ahead, ask us your question. All right, I'm gonna to try to make this brief. Uh, all right, so I was talking earlier this week with a guy who is running in a Republican primary for Congress out in California. Okay, he is running as the non-Trumpy candidate. And you know he is a charismatic guy who's really interested in the future and solving problems and evolving the party. He's the kind of guy that we all say that we're looking for, that that's what we want to feel, how we want to, to move forward in our politics. But of course, the problem that he's running into, as you would imagine, is the party infrastructure, all the activists, the party, you know, they're supporting the Trumpy guy. He's having a hard time getting his message out to anybody. And I asked him, all right, well, you know, this is not an impossible problem to solve because he's actually a good fit for the district. All right, so you identify all the people who, all of us, all the people who are looking for guys like that. And there's enough of them in your district. You get them out on election day mm -hmm. and there's people whose job it is to do this. There's a whole industry. What kind of, so we're like, how do we get you that help? And the bottom line was he really had no idea. Not, nobody reached out to him. He didn't even know where to start. And that, so the big problem it seems to me is we're having these conversations. People are, we all recognize this problem, but where is the infrastructure to fill Congress up with the kinds of people and the, our parties up, whether it is to start fresh I mean, anyone who knows my writing knows I've given up on the parties right. and I think we need to start with something new or to take over the party. But where is the work on that infrastructure that, you know, we can sit and talk about it because, you know, these problems that we're facing, yeah. I think that's why people are angry. It's not just people are polarized because they're sitting back and the country seems to be falling apart and nobody's doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. And we all know this and we want people like that. And yet, Who's building the infrastructure and why are we not building that infrastructure to yeah. get those people where we want them? Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Frank. Um, that's a good question. And uh, I, that feels like a Bill Crystal question to me. I mean, I think there is, yeah. A, there is some infrastructure. People should get in touch with us at Defending Democracy Together. B, California has nonpartisan primaries. And in fact, he should be able to, uh, he should be run be, become the alternative to the Trump Republican. If it's a Republicanish district, he probably has a better chance of winning the runoff than a Democrat. Uh, I've been very, last, spent the last several days trying to persuade Democrats from the top down to think about trying to recruit, and I think some of it's happening, Anthony Gonzalez to run as a Democrat in Ohio 16 because he couldn't, he didn't want to run as, he doesn't want to be part of the Republican conference. Uh, but the truth is a normal Democrat's not going to win that district. It's too, it's too Republican a district. But Gonzalez at getting the Democrat votes and the kind of swing Republican votes, he, he outran Trump in the district, could win. Now, I think the Democratic Party, I've got to say to their credit, is open to this. 
you know, recruiting what Pete Buttigieg called future former Republicans. I don't mean literally that many members of Congress, but people who have a Republican-ish background uh, to run. There's not, it is a little hard. You have to do it though kind of case by case and it's not so easy to do. And they're often Democrats who are next in line, state legislator, the state assembly person who, you know, wants to have that nomination. And so it's a little hard to, to maneuver this and, and, it, and it's quite different from state to state and district to district. But I think some of this is happening naturally and uh, some of it's gonna happen more organizationally. Liam Kerr started something called the Welcome Party, which is an attempt to get these people in, to get the yeah. Democratic party to have a bigger tent. Uh, so we'll see, but but, the, but again, he, well, let's get to the chase though. The question that this guy's gonna face, I don't know who he is, is who are you voting for for speaker? Are you still good about for Kevin? Are you a loyal Republican? Are you voting for Kevin McCarthy for speaker? I couldn't blame moderate Democrats for saying, I'm sorry, he might be a great guy, but we, I do not want Kevin McCarthy as speaker. If I were a moderate Democrat, I'd say that. I say, this is myself. And therefore I might just have to, I'm not gonna be able to support you. So this is the problem when you have a party that's predominantly radicalized, if I can put it that way, for the Republican Party. It's very hard to for the more moderate figure, figures to figure out, to make the case for themselves in this way, because are you still, they might be good people, but aren't they signing on to a bunch of committee chairs and a leadership with McCarthy and Stefanik that they don't, that a lot of voters are going to think, swing voters will think is unacceptable. So it's a, it's a tricky situation. Understood. Got it. Okay, thank you very much, Bill and Frank. Thank you for your question. Let's move to uh, Susan Brewer. So, Susan, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Hey, thanks. So, um, so the toxicity of the times is undermining. Um, I think our expectations now, um, certainly when we look to what we read or we take in on social media, is another excuse to get more angry. You know what I mean? So we're all succeeding at getting very angry and um, getting disillusioned by the process. Um, I'm looking at um, 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 Fukuyama's book, uh, The End of History and the Last Man. And uh, he's got here um, that uh, eventually what uh, dialectically uh, we're, uh, politics is, is driven to do is to uh, replace uh, one um, system by the next more successful system. And um, in a way, um, I, I think that we would make uh, greater inroads if we were less surprised at how different the two political sides are. If we, is it possible to be able to understand the political differences as natural and as not a surprise and as a chance to uh, begin to try to uh, resolve this uh, uh, contradiction. And when I think of uh, what might have driven the Trumpists, um, um, uh, you know, they did, we didn't know they existed. And that basically somehow um, to have them be able to claim something, even if all we do is uh, uh, say, you shouldn't be, you know, you're not good enough, you aren't virtuous enough, but, you know, they've got to find, they've got to be given some way to, to be on a moral ground that we will say Okay, we'll take you seriously. You know, it may be a pipe dream, and it may, I may not even have expressed that well, but I hope I have. Mm. Well, I hear, I hear what you're saying, Susan. Uh, and I have actually made a proposal uh, that might go some way towards uh, meeting. Uh, the, the objection that you just raised. Uh, I would say that in the past half century or so, what we've seen is a massive nationalization of our politics uh, and of our public policy. Uh, the late Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, became famous for saying that all politics is local and he was famous because at the time he said that, you could make a pretty good argument that that was true. I don't think you can make that argument at all. I think it's closer to the truth to say 
that at this point, all politics is national. And what we're witnessing is the nationally divisive consequences of nationalizing just about everything. So here's a thought experiment. What if we took federalism more seriously than we have for quite some time? What if we gave a higher priority to local diversity, uh, leaving uh, the nationalization to the bare constitutional essentials? We would have more of a patchwork country, but we also might have a country with less anger and less division because different kinds of folks in different areas might have an opportunity to express themselves more than they do now. Now, I recognize both the historical resonance of this proposal, you know, which, is, which has its unattractive elements, and also the contemporary objections. But and now here I'll take a deep breath. In 1971, exactly 50 years ago, Ruth Bader Ginsburg made a coherent argument against the nationalization of the abortion issue. Was she wrong? Hmm. Leaving us on the edge of our edge of our seat here, uh, uh, Bill. Um, Okay. I, might, I might interject real quick, uh, just because I don't want us to miss this rather important point. We talk about, you know, infrastructure and, and bipartisanship. Um, and, and Bill Crystal's alluded to this and then actually mentioned it quite directly is like, how do you talk about working across the aisle when, when if, you're, if the polls are to be believed, three quarters of Republicans believe that Biden is not a legitimately elected president? We see believing conspiracies, um, which, you know, uh, if you look in the Bush years, you know, there were some conspiracies that were Democrats were prone to believe, but now we're seeing it much more active on the right. Um, so whether it's deep, deep state or, or um, uh, conspiracies about, you know, vaccines, like it, it's a huge problem and the information environment is a big problem. You know, one of the things I mentioned earlier is that we have these, you know, information bubbles and a lot of that when, when you, when, I say that phrase, you probably think about, oh, it's the media, it's the media environment, or it's Facebook, it's social media. But if you look at interpersonally, uh, if you look at people who have friends who, whose politics largely mirror their own, they have more extreme political beliefs, uh, they're more likely to believe in, believe in conspiracy theories. So you can't address any of this stuff directly from, from the top, I don't think, but you have to take seriously the different information diets, how people are getting their news and information, uh, and you have to start there if you want to sort of think seriously about, about addressing any of these um, sort of divergent beliefs. Yeah, we didn't talk too much about, we didn't talk much about that uh, in the meat of our conversation, but you're right, Dan, it's an indispensable factor um, that we've got to apply to our thinking on this subject. Okay, uh, coming to the very end here, I see Anthony Brown and, and I also see Nicole Penn. Um, if we go quickly, maybe we can get you both in, but let's start with Anthony, if that's okay. Anthony, unmute yourself and uh, ask us your question. Thank you. I'll be sure. So I just wanted to ask the panelists to some degree what they thought we had. Okay, I, th I think that Anthony has fallen victim to technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> sorry, sorry to see it, but it does happen in the age of Zoom. Okay, Nicole. Uh, go ahead and, and ask us your question. Sure. Um, so I actually just want to pick up on a couple of themes from Dan's research. Um, Dan, and, and maybe, you know, if, if the Bill, uh, Crystal and Bill Galston have some contextualizing thoughts. Um, you know, where, what is the state of polling right now on how loneliness intersects with um, political radicalization? Um, so, so that's one, one component. And the other thing I'm curious about is some really interesting polling that's been coming out regarding how people apply religious terms like evangelical, that the divisions between um, you know, individuals who have been in that tradition for a long time versus those who are now conflating that label with, with being a, a Republican, particularly as one defined during the Trump era. You know, what does that say? What are the trends there and how might they be misunderstood or, or alternatively, how might they be offering clarity to the situation on the ground? Because I think those have been two really interesting threads. Yeah, I think we could have two separate conversations on, on those questions. I'll try to get to, to the first one and maybe the second one if there's time. 
Um, but I actually want to jump off something that Bill Dawson said earlier uh, when we talk about the major economic disruptions uh, that happened, you know, uh, particularly for, for working class uh, folks without a college degree. And in our work, we're seeing, you know, consistent with a lot of other, other sociological work, uh, decline in social capital. P people have fewer friends today, close friends today than they did in the past. And it's a particularly uh, pro particularly big problem for, for folks without a college degree. So non-college folks have lost way more uh, close friends than, than college educated folks. And I've done some theorizing around this, but it, it's sort of a longer project. Uh, but the, the things that I, I've seen so far that, that make me believe this is sort of what's going on, the decline of the labor movement, uh, which, you know, whatever we want to think about their, their you know, financial policies and economic policies and, and all that, um, we're an incredibly important, important source of social support for a lot of these workers. The decline of religion, um, I think, disproportionately hurt uh, non-college educated folks. Um, and lastly, as Putnam found, uh, the decline of, of civic associational life. And, and again, I think, you know, we think about bowling leagues and other things, again, this, this I think, uh, hurt sort of the non-college group a lot more. They weren't able to find alternatives where, whereas folks with college education can turn to maybe sort of commercial spaces, you know, whether it's gyms or other social clubs. Uh, and so I think that has a, a pretty critical downstream effect on how they think about their place in society, um, the kind of politicians that are attractive to them, kind of more authoritarian types that sort of say, hey, you know, that, you know, society has absolutely left you behind. Um, you know, you've been left on your own. I, I will solve this for you. I mean, that kind of rhetoric is much more appealing if you are living that experience, right? Whether it's sort of deaths of despair, loneliness, all that, all those kind of negative rippling out effects from kind of uh, sort of the climate uh, economic situation. So I think, yeah. So that is is something that's really an important uh, sort of some important facts to grapple with as we have these conversations on, on religion. Uh, there's like a whole conversation to have. Pew did some really cool stuff on uh, evangelical identity, and you know, there's been good work done by PRI on that, on that front in terms of just looking at sort of national uh, evangelical identity, which, which has not uh, declined as much as other religious traditions in, in recent years, where we've been seeing sort of overall decline. Um, and some of that might be because it's being kind of imbued with political meaning, right? So people are coming to the label because of, of uh, sort of what they think about sort of the politics of evangelicals. And obviously some folks are obviously being repelled for the same reason. Indeed. Dan, thank you very much um, for that outstanding overview to close us out uh, in this conversation. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, our great appreciation for William Galston, William Crystal, Dan Cox. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here today and being a part of this conversation. And my sincere thanks, sincere thanks to American Purpose, uh, to Nicole Stan, Jeffrey Gedman, uh, to, uh, to Nicole Penn, Jeffrey Gedman, and all of our friends um, from Braver Angels, to you and to each and every one of you watching at home. Um, don't lose hope. The American Project endures. And I would like to say that our best days are still yet to come. So let's believe in it. Folks, thank you so much. Until next time, I'm John Wood Jr. This has been a pleasure. Thanks so much, John and everyone.